Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Alright, so today we've got kind of an unusual episode in that a lot of what we're going to be talking about isn't actually Realms, but you'll see why when we get to it. First of all, I want to talk about Wrath of the Blue Lady by Mel Autumn. So, I started on this one, and I just didn't get very far. It's, uh, there's a blue lady who might be good or evil or whatever, and she's, like, haunting this area of the sea, and our story starts out a little bit earlier than the 1479 or wherever it takes place, and, uh, there's, like, this guy who's nearly gonna be killed, and she rescues him, but it seems for evil purposes. And it just reminded me so much of of his Threat from the Sea, or whatever it's called, trilogy. And, like, nothing about the character stood out, or, you know, like, I, I just, I found myself, like, having to force myself to get even the 20 or 30 pages into it that I got. I just, I gave up on that. I assumed at some point in the near future, the blue lady would be calling the main character my little Malenti, even though he's not Malenti or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's part of the wilds. Next is another part of the wilds, Restless Shore by James P. Davis. Strangely, I don't have a copy. My library doesn't have a copy, and I don't really want to pay money for one that I, I haven't liked anything by James P. Davis so far, so I don't think there's any chance of that. I do have... Circle of Skulls, uh, so I will give that a shot later, and if I like that, then I'll probably hunt down Restless Shore, because, you know, maybe it's just a timing method or whatever. Next, let's talk about, this is kind of the big thing here in the weird, uh, uh, diversion from the realms here. I know I didn't do Spelljammer, but I think I'm gonna do the Abyssal Plague, simply because... You know, with 4th edition, we haven't... I, I mean, all, all the transitions in the 4th edition, sure. But in 4th edition itself, we don't really have a big event uh, that's going on. It's all these tiny little things. And even though I don't know any details of the Sundering, I've heard that the event kind of happens in the background. And so we don't really get, like, an event event. And so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do the Abyssal Plague, which does cross over into the realms, and uh, look at it as a whole. As you probably remember there for a couple of years... Wizards decided to actually make the basic D&D setting, which I thought was kind of always assumed to be Greyhawk, but now that doesn't seem the case. It just seems to be this Nenter Vale uh, area. They decided to make it like a real thing and throw out books about it and try to get people excited and yada, yada, yada. And I, I, I guess it wasn't that successful because even before they stopped uh, publishing all sorts of uh, fiction, um, I think they stopped publishing the basic D&D stuff. So first we have The Gates of Madness by James Wyatt, which is this uh, five or six part little thing uh, that they released in the back of other books. And then it's still, you can grab it for free online and uh, check it out. I'm, I'm a little confused about how time works as compared to the basic D&D &D world and uh, the realms. And it could be because, so essentially like at, at one point in the climax, this one character is thrown through a gate and they're like, oh my God, we'll never see you again. And he's called the Sword of the Gods. And the Abyssal Plague crossover book by Cordell that we'll get to later is called the Sword of the Gods. And I checked the back of the book and yeah, it's that character. So it's like, my assumption was that Gates of Madness takes place in kind of a concurrent to 1479 time, because the character, I think he's human. I don't recall him being something that would last hundreds of years, but maybe he is, and I'm just totally misremembering that. But I, I could swear that he was a human paladin. In any case, Gates of Madness is uh, all about this Void Harrow being released. Um, I, I honestly don't remember. It's So the, the, the problem is, the main kind of baddie, uh, the big bad for this whole crossover event, is very confusing. It's There's like this chained god, Thara's Dune, who apparently planted a seed in the elemental chaos, and that seed grew into the abyss, and now somehow that's related to the fact that there's this living liquid called the Void Harrow, which could infect people and things, and turn them demonic? I, uh, it's really confusing. Like, I mean, what I just said sounds 
fairly straightforward, but the way that it affects everything in the book, I mean, it's like, what does that mean to plant a seed in the chaos that turned into an abyss? What sort of seed was it? Was it the Void Harrow? How did it, I mean, it doesn't, like, I just, it, it it's all of these, like, huge, expansive things, and I think that's cool, but I don't feel they do a very good job of explaining it. At least so far, Wyatt and Don Bassingthwaite haven't. Uh, from Don Bassingthwaite, we go into the Prelude, which is Mark of Nereth. And it's been so long since I've read Mark of Nereth that I couldn't remember the details, but I remember it being a jumbled mess. And here, early on in Temple of the Yellow Skulls, he kind of, sort of, sums it up. Listen to how busy this is. And, and we're talking about, like, a 300-page book, right? All three groups had different quests. Albanon and Roghar pursued New Orleans and Tempest. Okay, all right. So I gotta stop right there and tell you the names in here are friggin' ridiculous, okay? Like, Albanon? I think it's supposed to be Albanon, but it reads as Albanon, which just makes him sound like a shoe store salesman or something, right? And then this evil, shape-changing entity is called New Orleans. I can't hear that without thinking of New Orleans, right? Like... <laughs> Like, it's a Cajun drawl of the city, New Orleans. Oh no, New Orleans getting away. Like, it just... How can you take it seriously? Okay. All three groups had different quests. Al Bannon and Roghar per pursued New Orleans and Tempest, of course, while Uldane and Shara sought a green dragon, Vestapalk, who had slaughtered friends and family. Fallon and Darum, on the run from undead creatures intent on killing the cleric, were searching for a way to end the attacks. Eric was the lodestone that drew their quests together, showing them how their goals intersected. In the tunnels beneath Thunderspire Mountain, they'd freed Tempest and driven off New Allen. Beyond the mountains, among the old hills, they'd descended into a vast ancient necropolis. There, with Eric's help, Fallon and Darum had fought a powerful undead wizard, a lich by their description, which meant that his defeat was no mean feat. Al Bannon and the others, meanwhile, had tangled with Vestapalk, ultimately sending the dragon plummeting to his doom in a deep crevasse. So busy. It is busy, busy, busy. We have approximately nine main characters and 300 pages. I mean, even when they're in groups, that's like 50 pages per character, if that. And it's not if that, okay? It's just, it's not. It's a mess. But it was fun. Like, I remember just reading through it and half the time being like, I don't even remember who this person is, but uh, what the hell? Like, it just, it goes so quickly. It's got kind of not quite old school D&D problems with its writing. Just that problem of where things are overwritten and there's not much interest in caring about if you've used the same word in the last sentence and so on and so forth. But, I mean, it's decent enough. Temple of Yellow Skulls, which is our official part one of the Abyssal Plague trilogy, is a little better, I guess, because we have fewer main characters. Basic plot is Shara and Uldane and Al Bannon are now, they, they've stuck around in Falkrest, I think it is, the town uh, where Al Bannon was originally from, and they're there. Shara and Uldane have avenged their friends, the dragon is dead. What are they going to do? But, oops, plot twist, record scratch, they find out that actually uh, when they killed uh, the dragon Vestapalk, some Void Harrow got into him, and that made him into an, a, essentially a demonic Draco Lich. And so now he and his kobold worm priest are hanging out, turning things into demons. The, uh, and, you know, and then there's this really side plot involving the Temple of Yellow Skulls where the dragon sends out one of his people to go get this treasure from the Temple of Yellow Skulls. But I want to bring up an issue where early on there's a discussion between people about why it's more upsetting to kill the undead than demons and essentially it's like it's it's kind of given as a definite answer that undead used to be living but demons are just demons. That's how they are. But then we see that the Void Harrow creates demons. So it's like, well, these things are, if we're to take everybody at face value, these things are demons, and they used to be, you know, not necessarily humans, but uh, sentient creatures that weren't demonic. Like, that whole argument seems to go out the window, and 
didn't really have a place in this book because like if, if if it was done on purpose to show oh we were wrong that's one thing but that's it's never brought up that way that's never done it's just kind of like eh, whatever so yeah um this crossover is so far a mess not greatly written and a confusing adversary but maybe one star is dune the chained god uh, which is weird saying that because of course that was the uh, Malazan, um, big adversary. It's, uh, but his name started with a K, I think. Everybody's name in the Malazan <laughs> series started with a K. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of a mess so far, but I'm really curious to see what happens from here. I feel like really Gates of Madness was probably all I needed to read before, uh, Sword of the Gods. Uh, Shadowbane, however, which is a sequel to Downshadow, is also part of the Abyssal Plague crossover. You know, this is so there's a, a a main trilogy of Abyssal Plague books, and then there's other stuff where the the plague spreads or whatever. Like for instance, I'm gonna I'm probably gonna read Under a Crimson Sun, which is where the Dark Sun spreads, but I doubt I'll mention it on here because it just really doesn't. I, I mean, in, uh, unless when I read it, I'm like, oh my god, this ties in in some huge way. But uh, like, I like dark sun so i'll probably read it but i don't think it really has any place here so yeah next time we'll be looking at most likely oath of vigilance which is part two of the abyssal plague then on to sword of the gods and shadowbane uh that's that's what i'm going to try to do anyway it could be that i just hate it all and so we run right through it but i'm really curious to see how it turns out because again i think it's fun to have kind of a big wacky crossover event so far with this thing I'm fearing that the big climax of book three is going to be Falkrest being invaded by these demonic creatures, because that's what I thought was going to be the end of book one. End of book one, that still hasn't happened, and so it's like, oh my god, this might be a lot smaller than I thought it would be. And it seems like it should be huge, right? It's this, like, universally gigantic, like, the abyss being created, and yada 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 sort of event. But, uh, but yeah, for now, we're not really doing anything gigantic. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe if not next time, maybe the time after that. Uh, let me know what you think. Did anybody else read these? Go for it. Did anybody read Sword of the Gods and Shadowbane and think, well, it totally wasn't necessary to have read that stuff? Just curious. Oh, and the reason, I guess I didn't touch on it, the reason that the timing is off, I mentioned how I assumed the Gates of Madness was in the present, but then in Temple of Yellow Skulls, it's talked about how New Orleans is a being that was created, like, long, long, long ago. Like, I think thousands of years ago from this character named maybe Albaric, something like that. And Albaric is one of the characters in Gates of Madness, and he gets hit with the Void Harrow and he turns into New Orleans. So it's like, okay, I guess Gates of Madness had to be way in the past. Which, if way in the past for D&D, central core area matches up to 1479 uh, realms, that's pretty weird, right? I mean, that seems weird. But my assumption is just that because he's thrown through, through the gate of madness or whatever, that it's, you know, it's like the city on the edge of forever, right? It's uh, the, what's that, what's that called? The Guardian or whatever. It just, it can be any time, anywhere. So uh, that's, that's my assumption. We'll see. Maybe it's brought up in Sword of the Gods. Maybe Sword of the Gods is not going to have anything to do with this at all. Maybe simply that character being in the realms is the only way it will cross over. I honestly have no idea how else it could unless just demons are going to pop up, but who knows? We'll see when we get there. I like fighting some demons. Oh yeah, this, uh, speaking of fighting, that's one thing about Temple of Yellow Skulls. I will say Don Bassingthwaite, I think, is really good at the action scenes. Uh, I really enjoyed the action scenes that were in here. I thought he kept him fast and fresh. And, uh, like, there's there's one scene that's basically like a halfling going up against a character for nearly a chapter, and it's really well written. So, even though I didn't like it overall, I thought that was well worth the time. Anyway, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered. <laughs>